Chapter Sixteen of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Sixteen: The Hospital as a College. The hospital is the only proper college in which to rear a true disciple of Esculapius. Abernethy. The most essential part of a student's instruction is obtained, as I believe, not in the lecture room, but at the bedside. Nothing seen there is lost. The rhythms of disease are learned by frequent repetition. Its unforeseen occurrences stamp themselves indelibly on the memory. Before the student is aware of what he has acquired, he has learned the aspects and causes and probable issue of the diseases he has seen with his teacher, and the proper mode of dealing with them, so far as his master knows. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Introductory Lecture, 1867 Chapter 16 The Hospital as a College Delivered at the Academy of Medicine, New York, 1903 the last quarter of the last century saw many remarkable changes and reformations, among which, in far-reaching general importance, not one is to be compared with the reform, or rather revolution, in the teaching of the science and art of medicine. Whether the conscience of the professors at last awoke and felt the pricking of remorse, or whether the change, as is more likely, was only part of that larger movement toward larger events in the midst of which we are today, did not be here discussed. The improvement has been in three directions, in demanding of the student a better general education, in lengthening the period of professional study, and in substituting laboratories for lecture rooms, that is to say, in the replacement of theoretical by practical teaching. The problem before us as teachers may be very briefly stated, to give to our students an education of such a character that they can become sensible practitioners, the destiny of seven-eighths of them. Toward this end are all our endowments, our multiplying laboratories, our complicated curricula, our palatial buildings, in the four years course, a division is very properly made between the preparatory or scientific branches and the practical. The former are taught in the school or college, the latter in the hospital. Not that there is any essential difference. There may be as much science taught in a course of surgery as in a course of embryology. The special growth of the medical school in the past 25 years has been in the direction of the practical teaching of science. Everywhere the lectures have been supplemented or replaced by prolonged practical courses, and instead of a single laboratory devoted to anatomy, there are now laboratories of physiology, of physiological chemistry, of pathology, of pharmacology, and of hygiene. Apart from the more attractive mode of presentation and the more useful character of the knowledge obtained in this way, the student learns to use the instruments of precision, gets a mental training of incalculable value, and perhaps catches some measure of the scientific spirit. The main point is that he has no longer merely theoretical knowledge acquired in a lecture room, but a first-hand practical acquaintance with the things themselves. He not only has dissected the sympathetic system, but he has set up a chymograph and can take a blood pressure observation. He has personally studied the action of digitalis, of chloroform, and of ether. He has made his own culture media, and he has plated organisms. The young fellow who is sent on to us in his third year is nowadays a fairly well-trained man, and in a position to begin his life's work in those larger laboratories, private and public, 
which nature fills with her mistakes and experiments. How can we make the work of the student in the third and fourth year as practical as it is in his first and second? I take it for granted we all feel that it should be. The answer is, take him from the lecture room, take him from the amphitheater, put him in the outpatient department, put him in the wards. It is not the systematic lecture, not the amphitheater clinic, not even the ward class, all of which have their value, in which the reformation is needed, but in the whole relationship of the senior student to the hospital. During the first two years, he is thoroughly at home in the laboratories, domiciled, we may say, with his place in each one, to which he can go and work quietly under a tutor's direction and guidance. To parallel this condition in the third and fourth years, certain reforms are necessary. First, in the conception of how the art of medicine and surgery can be taught. My firm conviction is that we should start the third-year student at once on his road of life. Ask any physician of twenty years standing how he has become proficient in his art, and he will reply by constant contact with disease. And he will add that the medicine he learned in the schools was totally different from the medicine he learned at the bedside. The graduate of a quarter of a century ago went out with little practical knowledge, which increased only as his practice increased. In what may be called the natural method of teaching, the student begins with the patient, continues with the patient, and ends his studies with the patient, using books and lectures as tools, as means to an end. The student starts, in fact, as a practitioner as an observer of disordered machines, with the structure and orderly functions of which he is perfectly familiar. Teach him how to observe, give him plenty of facts to observe, and the lessons will come out of the facts themselves. For the junior student in medicine and surgery, it is a safe rule to have no teaching without a patient for a text, and the best teaching is that taught by the patient himself. The whole art of medicine is in observation, as the old motto goes, but to educate the eye to see, the ear to hear, and the finger to feel, takes time, and to make a beginning, to start a man on the right path, is all that we can do. We expect too much of the student, and we try to teach him too much. Give him good methods and a proper point of view and all other things will be added as his experience grows. The second, and what is the most important reform, is in the hospital itself. In the interests of the medical student, of the profession, and of the public at large, we must ask from the hospital authorities much greater facilities than are at present enjoyed. At least, by the students of a majority of the medical schools of this country. The work of the third and fourth year should be taken out of the medical school entirely and transferred to the hospital, which, as Abernathy remarks, is the proper college for the medical student, in his last years at least. An extraordinary difficulty here presents itself. While there are institutions in which the students have all the privileges to be desired, there are others in which they are admitted by side entrances to the amphitheatre of the hospital, while from too many the students are barred as hurtful to the best interests of the patients. The work of an institution in which there is no teaching is rarely first class. There is not that keen interest nor the thorough study of the cases, nor amid the exigencies of the busy life is the hospital physician able to escape clinical slovenliness unless he teaches, and in turn is taught, by assistants and students. It is, I think, safe to say that in a hospital with students in the wards, the patients are more carefully looked after, their diseases are more fully studied, 
and fewer mistakes made. The larger question of the extended usefulness of the hospital in promoting the diffusion of medical and surgical knowledge, I cannot here consider. I envy for our medical students the advantages enjoyed by the nurses, who live in daily contact with the sick, and who have, in this country at least, supplanted the former in the affections of the hospital trustees. The objection often raised that patients do not like to have students in the wards is entirely fanciful. In my experience, it is just the reverse. On this point I can claim to speak with some authority, having served as a hospital physician for more than twenty-five years, and having taught chiefly in the wards, with the exercise of ordinary discretion, and if one is actuated by kindly feelings towards the patients, there is rarely any difficulty. In the present state of medicine, it is very difficult to carry out the work of a first-class hospital without the help of students. We ask far too much of the resident physicians, whose number has not increased in proportion to the enormous increase in the amount of work thrust upon them, and much of the routine work can be perfectly well done by senior students. How practically can this be carried into effect? Let us take the third-year students first. A class of one hundred students may be divided into ten sections, each of which may be called a clinical unit, which should be in charge of one instructor. Let us follow the course of such a unit through the day. On Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at 9 a.m., elementary instruction in physical diagnosis. From 10 to 12 a.m., practical instruction in the outpatient department. This may consist in part in seeing the cases in a routine way, in receiving instruction how to take histories, and in becoming familiar with the ordinary aspect of disease as seen in a medical out clinic. At 12 o'clock, a senior teacher could meet four or even five of the units, dealing more systematically with special cases. The entire morning, or where it is customary to have the hospital practice in the afternoon, a large part of the afternoon, two or three hours at least, should be spent in the outpatient department. No short six weeks course, but each clinical unit throughout the session should, as a routine, see outpatient practice under skilled direction. Very soon these students are able to take histories, have learned how to examine the cases, and the outpatient records gradually become of some value. Of course, all of this means abundance of clinical material, proper space in the outpatient department for teaching, sufficient apparatus and young men who are able and willing to undertake the work. On the alternate days, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, the clinical unit, which we are following, is in the surgical outpatient department, seeing minor surgery, learning how to bandage, to give ether, and helping in all the interesting work of a surgical dispensary. Groups of three or four units should be in charge of a demonstrator of morbid anatomy, who would take them to post-mortems, the individual men doing the work, and one day in the week all the units could attend the morbid anatomy demonstration of the professor of pathology. I take for granted that the student has got so far that he has finished his pathological histology in his second year, which is the case in the more advanced schools. Other hours of the day for the third year could be devoted to the teaching of obstetrics, materia medica, therapeutics, hygiene, and clinical microscopy. At the end of the session in a well-conducted school, the third-year student is really a very well-informed fellow. He knows the difference between Potts' disease and Potts' fracture. He can readily feel an enlarged spleen, and he knows the difference between Charcot's crystals and Charcot's joint. In the fourth year, I would still maintain the clinical unit of ten men, whose work would be transferred from the outpatient department to the wards. Each man should be allowed to serve in the medical and, for as long a period as possible, 
in the surgical wards. He should be assigned four or five beds. He has had experience enough in his third year to enable him to take the history of the new cases, which would need, of course, supervision or correction by the senior house officer or attending physician. Under the supervision of the house physician, he does all of the work connected with his own patients, analysis of the urine, etc., and takes the daily record as dictated by the attending physician. One or two of the clinical units are taken round the wards three or four times in the week by one of the teachers for a couple of hours. The case is commented upon, the students asked questions, and the groups made familiar with the progress of the cases. In this way the student gets a familiarity with disease, a practical knowledge of clinical methods, and a practical knowledge of how to treat disease. With equal advantage the same plan can be followed in the surgical wards, and in the obstetrical and gynecological departments. An old method. It is the only method by which medicine and surgery can be taught properly, as it is the identical manner in which the physician is himself taught when he gets into practice. The radical reform needed is in the introduction into this country of the system of clinical clerks and surgical dressers who should be just as much a part of the machinery of the wards as the nurses or the house physicians. There is no scarcity of material. On the contrary, there is abundance. Think of the plethora of patients in this city, the large majority of whom are never seen, not to say touched, by a medical student. Think of the hundreds of typhoid fever patients, the daily course of whose disease is never watched or studied by our pupils. Think how few of the hundreds of cases of pneumonia which will enter the hospitals during the next three months will be seen daily, hourly, in the wards by the fourth-year men. And yet it is for this they are in the medical school just as much as, more indeed, then they are in it to learn the physiology of the liver or the anatomy of the hip joint. But, you may ask, how does such a plan work in practice? From a long experience I can answer, admirably. It has been adopted in the Johns Hopkins Medical School, of which the hospital, by the terms of the founder's will, is an essential part. There is nothing special in our material, our wards are not any better than those in other first-class hospitals, but a distinctive feature is that greater provision is made for teaching students, and perhaps for the study of disease. Let me tell you in a few words just how the work is conducted. The third-year students are taught medicine. First, in a systematic course of physical diagnosis, conducted by Drs. Thayer and Futcher, the associate professors of medicine, in the rooms adjacent to the outpatient department. In the second half of the year, after receiving instruction in history taking, the students take notes and examine outpatients. Secondly, three days in the week at the conclusion of the outpatient hours, the entire class meets the teacher in an adjacent room, and the students are taught how to examine and study patients. It is remarkable how many interesting cases can be shown in the course of a year in this way. Each student who takes a case is expected to report upon and keep track of it, and is questioned with reference to its progress. The opportunity is taken to teach the student how to look up questions in the literature by setting subjects upon which to report in connection with the cases they have seen. A class of fifty can be dealt with very conveniently in this manner. Thirdly, the clinical microscopy class. The clinical laboratory is part of the hospital equipment. It is in charge of a senior assistant, who is one of the resident officers of the hospital. There is room in it for about 100 students on two floors, each man having his own work table and locker, and a place in which he can have his own specimens and work at odd hours. The course is a systematic one. 
given throughout the session, from two hours to two hours and a half, twice a week, and consists of routine instruction in the methods of examining the blood and secretions, the gastric contents, urine, etc. This could be made a most invaluable course, enabling the student to continue the microscopic work which he has had in his first and second years, and he familiarizes himself with the use of a valuable instrument, which becomes in this way a clinical tool and not a mere toy. The clinical laboratory in the medical school should be connected with the hospital, of which it is an essential part. Nowadays, the microscopical, bacteriological, and chemical work of the wards demand skilled labor, and the house physicians, as well as the students, need the help and supervision of experts in clinical chemistry and bacteriology, who should form part of the resident staff of the institution. Fourthly, the general medical clinic. One day in the week, in the amphitheater, a clinic is held for the third and fourth year students, and the more interesting cases in the wards are brought before them. As far as possible, we present the diseases of the seasons, and in the autumn, special attention is given to malarial and typhoid fever, and later in the winter, to pneumonia. Committees are appointed to report on every case of pneumonia and the complications of typhoid fever. There are no systematic lectures, but in the physical diagnosis classes, there are set recitations, and in what I call the observation class in the dispensary, held three times a week, general statements are often made concerning the diseases under consideration. Fourth Year Ward Work The class is divided into three groups, one in medicine, one in surgery, and one in obstetrics and gynecology, which serve as clinical clerks and surgical dressers. In medicine, each student has five or six beds. He takes notes of the new cases as they come in, does the urine and blood work, and helps the house physician in the general care of the patients. From nine to eleven, the visit is made with the clinical clerks, and systematic instruction is given. The interesting cases are seen and new cases are studied, and the students questioned with reference to the symptoms and nature of the disease and the course of treatment. What I wish to emphasize is that this method of teaching is not a ward class in which a group of students is taken into the ward and a case or two demonstrated. It is ward work, the students themselves taking their share in the work of the hospital just as much as the attending physician, the intern, or the nurse. Moreover, it is not an occasional thing. His work in medicine for the three months is his major subject, and the clinical clerks have from nine to twelve for their ward work, and an hour in the afternoon, in which some special questions are dealt with by the senior assistant or by the house physicians. The recitation class. As there are no regular lectures, to be certain that all of the subjects in medicine are brought before the students in a systematic manner, a recitation class is held once a week upon subjects set beforehand. The weekly clinic in the amphitheatre, in which the clinical clerks take leading parts, as they report upon their cases and read the notes of their cases brought before the class for consideration. Certain important aspects of medicine are constantly kept before this class. Week after week, the condition of the typhoid fever cases is discussed, the more interesting cases shown, the complications systematically placed upon the board. A pneumonia committee deals with all the clinical features of this common disease and a list of the cases is kept on the blackboard, and, during a session, the students have reports upon fifty or sixty cases, a large majority of which are seen in the clinic by all of them, while the clinical clerks have in the wards an opportunity of studying them daily. The general impression among the students and the junior teachers 
is that the system has worked well. There are faults, perhaps more than we see, but I am sure they are not in the system. Many of the students are doubtless not well informed theoretically on some subjects, as personally I have always been opposed to that base and most pernicious system of educating them with a view to examinations, but even the dullest learn how to examine patients and get familiar with the changing aspects of the important acute diseases. A pupil handles a sufficient number of cases to get a certain measure of technical skill, and there is ever kept before him the idea that he is not in the hospital to learn everything that is known, but to learn how to study disease and how to treat it, or rather, how to treat patients. A third change is in reorganization of the medical school. This has been accomplished in the first two years by an extraordinary increase in the laboratory work, which has necessitated an increase in the teaching forces, and indeed an entirely new conception of how such subjects as physiology, pharmacology, and pathology should be taught. A corresponding reformation is needed in the third and fourth years. Control of ample clinical facilities is as essential today as large, well-endowed laboratories, and the absence of this causes the clinical to lag behind the scientific education. Speaking for the Department of Medicine, I should say that three or four well-equipped medical clinics of 50 to 75 beds each, with outpatient departments under the control of the directors, are required for a school of maximum size, say 800 students. Within the next quarter of a century, the larger universities of this country will have their own hospitals in which the problems of nature, known as disease, will be studied as thoroughly as are those of geology or Sanskrit. But even with present conditions, much may be done. There are hundreds of earnest students, thousands of patients, and scores of well-equipped young men willing and anxious to do practical teaching. Too often, as you know full well, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. For the bread of the wards they are given the stones of the lecture room and amphitheatre. The dissociation of student and patient is a legacy of the pernicious system of theoretical teaching from which we have escaped in the first and second years. For the third and fourth year students, the hospital is the college. For the juniors, the outpatient department and the clinics. For the seniors, the wards. They should be in the hospital as part of its equipment, as an essential part, without which the work cannot be of the best. They should be in it as the place in which alone they can learn the elements of their art and the lessons which will be of service to them when in practice for themselves. The hospital with students in its dispensaries and wards doubles its usefulness in a community. The stimulus of their presence neutralizes that clinical apathy, certain, sooner or later, to beset the man who makes lonely rounds with his house physician. Better work is done for the profession and for the public. The practical education of young men, who carry with them to all parts of the country good methods, extends enormously the work of an institution and the profession is recruited by men who have been taught to think and to observe for themselves, and who become independent practitioners of the new school of scientific medicine, men whose faith in the possibilities of their art has been strengthened, not weakened, by a knowledge of its limitations. It is no new method which I advocate, but the old method of Bohave, of the elder Rutherford, of the Edinburgh School, of the older men of this city, and of Boston and of Philadelphia, the men who had been pupils of John Hunter, and of Rutherford and of Saunders. It makes of the hospital a college in which, 
as clinical clerks and surgical dressers, the students slowly learn for themselves, under skilled direction, the phenomena of disease. It is the true method, because it is the natural one, the only one by which a physician grows in clinical wisdom after he begins practice for himself. All others are bastard substitutes. End of chapter 16 The Hospital as a College Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales